Welcome to Just Break Up, the podcast about love, heartbreak, and all the relationship advice you don't want to hear. My name is Sierra DeMulder. And I'm Sam Blackwell. And today we're going to answer a letter from somebody who is struggling with the fact that all of her exes are now dating men. But before we begin, we just want to give you our Surgeon General's warning, which is that Sierra and I are licensed not, we are not licensed mental health practitioners, (laughs) almost called us something that we weren't. Uh, And also I'm not bisexual, so I'll just throw that out there too. In the context of this, of the response yes, to this yes, letter. Yes, 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 yes. So I will speak for the community. Um, <laughs> please yeah, do. Sam and I are not, not professionals. We are not trained in any of this. So please take our advice as you see fit. We're only here to offer our humble musings to hopefully shed some understanding and maybe some laughs about the incredibly rewarding but mostly confusing experience that is love. All right, it's Monday, so before we dive into today's letter, we're going to do a quick check-in topic. Uh, The check-in topic today is uniquely inspired by my own personal life. (laughs) You're going to say your own personal (laughs) hell. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, exactly. Uh, Okay, so this is, you know, this is mildly inspired by the fact that we recently got a review on Apple Podcasts, which, number one, thank you. It was mm-hmm. a five star review. Anybody who gives us a review, we're appreciative of you. Like it's it it helps us so that we can do our job longer. Um, and the review, but so the review the review was like five stars. They were like, we've been li- I've been listening from the beginning, and I would love if the host would share more about their personal lives because I always love when I learn something new about them. And Cute. when I first read it, I was like, oh my god, I feel like I chronically overshare on this show. <laughs> yeah, like, I feel like I'm always like bringing back my advice to my own experience. <laughs> like yes, I'm just always and, talking about myself. <laughs> if if I'm not talking about my personal like history, I'm talking about like discharge. I'm talking about like creepy <laughs> sex dreams I've had. I'm like, you know, I couldn't so overshare more. However, I get it. And also the the review was very kind because they were like, I think this is just the parasocial relationship that I want. But um, and it was a five star review. So, hey, here you go. You get a little personal thing from my life right now, which is I feel batshit <laughs> crazy. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Let me explain. This is this is going to turn into a quick check and topic about um, anxiously attached cuties in secure relationships. But to set the stage a little, I'm just having uh, I, I am coming out of like six weeks of illnesses in my house, um, you know, with my daughter being in daycare, lots of like schedule conflicts, lots of little life things breaking. Like um, we've had some issues with our car, our dishwasher like flooded um you know just lots of little annoying shit that you're like man i do not have time to call the person who needs to fix this or watch the youtube video (laughs) to learn how to fix this like i did with the dishwasher Um, i mean why wouldn't you (laughs) yeah exactly uh and and i have like a couple things on the horizon that i know are going to be challenging to me like emotionally emotionally and, and physically and and um that's all i'll say about that I just feel a little spread thin right now. And when anxiously attached cuties like me are, you know, dysregulated or feel like they're maybe they don't have the sense of security or the reservoir of, I don't know, sanity that they normally have access to. I have found myself recently feeling more, um, you know, more needy, more hypervigilant to my spouse's moods and her tones and her body language. And, um, you know, I listened to something on anxious attachments the other day and they said that like anxious attachments basically at their core just want emotional intimacy. And I was like, that makes sense because I've been feeling disconnected lately because my life has been so many like so much logistics, you know, and so much like, like we don't have time for a date night and we don't have, uh, you know, we're exhausted at the end of the day and I've got a toddler yelling at me and I'm overstimulated and whatever. So I'm obviously, I'm, I'm just noticing that like my nervous system is like spiked and whatever. And I've been really sensitive to my spouse's movements through the house the way we have conversations you know when she when she's complaining about the car not working i'm internalizing it because i'm feeling hyper vigilant i'm feeling you know deregulated and hyper vigilant and i'm looking for 
reasons that she doesn't love me or I'm looking for reasons that she's mad at me, you know, and this is all called, you know, none of this is like saying y'all, but I'm just trying to share. <laughs> um, Give that one reviewer yeah. <laughs> exactly what they want. <laughs> just a glimpse into your inner life. <laughs> but there is something to be learned here because uh, let me get to the point. So this morning I was my lovely and kind like wife was like, how you doing? Like, you know, you seem a little stressed lately. And I was like, I am, I feel really anxious. And I, you know, I've, we've got X, Y, and Z going on and um, I'm having a hard time just like feeling like on top of things. And, and I said, you know, and I feel like we've been missing each other. Like we keep having like these little like disconnections and spats all week. And my wife, God bless her, was like, what? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I don't remember a single argument from this week. And I, I don't mean this in like the gaslighting way. It wasn't like that didn't happen or I don't remember that. And because none of these dis moments of disconnection in my mind were big or toxic or, you know, it was like me hypervigilantly looking at her body language when she's talking to me about dinner or whatever, you know, um, just like well, really also seeking. Like, you know, it's, it's very possible that she was like, Using I, I body know, language annoyed. to convey something, right? Yeah, it's very possible she was annoyed or something, right? But it, but like in her experience of it, like that annoyance isn't like a huge deal. Like it's not, we're not fighting. It's just like, oh, I'm annoyed. But like that is an emotion that I can experience and move past and still be in love with and want to be with you. Whereas like you're looking yes, out and saying in like, the anxious annoyance, attachment <laughs> yeah, mode. Right? like yes. annoyance leads to her stopping loving me and leaving me because I've annoyed yes. her too many times. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. And so please know that this isn't my wife, like, you know, sweeping anything big under the rug, but it was so, I mean, I literally was like, what? And she was like, what are you talking about? And I was like, don't you feel like we've been having these like little disconnections lately? Um, and I'll come back to that word in a second because I think it's really poignant that I used it um, once I learned something about anxious attachment styles. Anyway, so my wife is like, give me specifics. Like, I don't remember any of these things. Like, and it, I said, to be honest, I feel so relieved that you're not that you haven't spent this week like annoyed at me or mad at me or whatever. I'm so relieved that that's your experience of the week. And also I'm discouraged because my like unstable self, like me when my cup is empty and, and, and I'm stressed and anxious and my nervous system is engaged. I will always, it, it feels like I'll always revert to that fear based mindset. So it was like, I was so relieved and I was also like discouraged and I called Sam and I was like, hey, I, am I crazy? <laughs> like, you know, um, and so then we talked for like an hour before recording. Um, and I, but I think it's it's it's. I'm sharing this because of that one review. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm sharing this. I'm sharing this because there must be other anxiously attached folks out there in secure, healthy relationships that are like feeling similarly or have felt similarly and have felt equally surprised by the fact that their partners are not, ex you know, that our fears are not matching our partner's realities, you know, that are, you know, um, can you say that better than me? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think it's the, like your hypervigilance is actually turning up nothing. You, you know what I mean? Yes. Where it's like, oh, I'm I'm noticing all those patterns. And then the, your partner being like, that's not a pattern, right? Like that's not. Yes, exactly. I am not on the verge of leaving you. I don't like, I'm not bad mouthing you to all my friends. Like I, I'm, and also like Willow's allowed to be annoyed. <laughs> you know what I yes, mean? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Right? No, like, I, I totally tell myself that. It was like. <laughs> we so we we had a long conversation after that initial conversation of like you're not experiencing this and I am and she she genuinely was like I, I don't remember a single time that I was like annoyed with you and she said and also we've been dealing with like annoying things all week like it's annoying to have to buy a new car and then have something wrong with it you know we don't have enough time in the day to deal with all the shit life is throwing at us right now and so she's like that's never a commentary 
she said, it feels like you're always internalizing my emotions. And I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is like, honestly, because like, I totally am. <laughs> no, for sure. Absolutely. And like, you know, I don't have an anxious attachment style, but I do have a lot of like a lot of training to be really mindful of other people's emotions. Uh, and like the way that that plays out is that, that other people aren't allowed to have emotions and that like I'm yes. denying them that experience. And I'm also, <sighs> yes. I'm also not allowed to have emotions because if I yes. convey an emotion, then people will pick up on it and they will, they will like think that I'm mad at them or that like, I'm le like, I'm so I police my own emotions so deeply because I'm afraid of the impact they're going to have on other people. Yeah. And it's like 100%. a double edged sword where it's like other people can't be upset with me. And also I can't be upset with other people, even though that's like a normal thing to be with people that you love. Yes. It's like frustrated or annoyed or like pissed off at them. Right. Like, and, and I, that is like something that is completely off the table for me. Like it is like not an emotion that I or anyone around me is like allowed to have. And that's like not yes helpful because like, guess what? I'm, I am going to get pissed off sometimes. And like yes. Peter is also going to get pissed off sometimes. And like, if we don't, figure out ways to express that with each other healthily, then yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't mean the emotions are going to go away. <laughs> it just means we're yes, not going to be exactly. dealing with them in a healthy way. <laughs> yeah. And from my spouse's perspective, she was like, you know, it's, it's concerning to her that I'm moving through our life, our, our house feeling as though something's fundamentally wrong or at risk or you know whatever and she's not she's like I feel I feel like I'm being oblivious like I'm missing out and I'm like no you're not <laughs> you're just like <laughs> you're, you're letting your the full spectrum <laughs> of emotion yeah not be internalized you know or whatever um so anyway Sam and I were just talking about this before we pressed record and then we thought we it could be our check-in topic because I'm sure they're number one it, it is always so helpful for me to talk out these sort of what I call like anxious attachment spirals um, because I think when we talk about anxious attachment styles, they're often in the context of someone of a partner who isn't secure and who is avoidant or who doesn't know how to deal with, with the, the, the need and the, and the, um, the vigilancy that comes with anxious attachment styles. And I really, it really, I have learned so much about myself in this stable relationship because unfortunately that shit still comes out, you know? And so I'm taking notes here like, okay, so you're, you've been really stressed. You're physically stressed. You've got a lot on your mind. You're overstimulated because your toddler just realized that she can shout. So I'm, I'm taking note that like, okay, well, I'm feeling a little strapped I'm feeling a little uh, overwhelmed in multiple places. And that's when my anxious attachment style like comes out to play. Okay. So next time I'm feeling stressed, I know that this is coming or whatever. Um, yeah. And also just like a general shout out to my anxiously attached cuties that like maybe what you're afraid of and what you're experiencing isn't what your partner's experiencing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like straight up, like maybe they're not feeling what you think they are feeling. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think like we often confuse like hypervigilance with intuition and like yeah. what I've had to really challenge myself on is like, I am not actually that intuitive. <laughs> I am actually really good at making up stories in my head about what other people are feeling and doing <laughs> like I'm That's really it. good at that, <laughs> but like, I, I mean, I think that I am pr actually pretty naturally intuitive, but I, but like this, like, yeah, this idea that I am like some sort of like empath is actually me putting a lot of my own shit onto other people as opposed to like actually understanding and feeling what they're feeling. Like, that's just me making it up out of my own fear that if I don't see everything that, like everyone's emotional state all the time, then people are going to get hurt and bad things are going to happen. Like it's not actually a super effective way of me knowing yes. what's going on in people's lives. <laughs> like it's actually, it's actually really bad at it. Like I'm really, cause I'm making up stories. I'm just like, I'm telling myself lies about what I think is really true. And then telling and then we're myself, looking, we're looking oh, for I'm, data and proof to back yeah. that up. 
back yeah, up absolutely. the stories it's like that we are assuming. A confirmation bias for sure, where I'm like, oh, I see they are upset. And it's like, what? No. <laughs> like, what are you doing? I I totally get it. So this is all to say, like, maybe there's some anxiously attached cuties out there or, um, you know, empath empathetic people who are maybe doing a little too much work that's not like helping them right now. Um, maybe y'all can, can join me in like chilling the fuck out. <laughs> and the this nicer is way your, to say that is. You're the invitation to just chill the fuck out. Chill everyone. out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or just know like you're in great company and you're doing all the right work. For sure. Um, and I love you. Absolutely. Um, all right, let's dive into today's letter. It is from... Dre Zilla, whose pronouns are she, her, who is writing to us from sunny Florida. Dear Sam and Sierra, I, she, her, am a 20-year-old lesbian who has so far experienced exclusively tumultuous relationships and situationships, but is nonetheless a pretty happy camper and a lover of great friends, sad songs, and therapy. I came out very publicly at the age of 17 or 18 and have since then always been very comfortable and confident in my sexuality and gender expression. I've made huge strides since my adolescence with social anxiety and don't have much trouble making and keeping solid friends or even with dating however i've had some weird feelings lately about some recent circumstances that have happened for context i've had two what i call significant relationships from the age of 17 to 20 both with women and both ending in heartbreak but ultimately lots of self-reflection and improvement a couple months ago i found out through the grapevine that my first girlfriend was in a relationship with a man now this stung for a few days because well that kind of stuff always does but given Given a lot of time had passed since we broke up and I had already done a, the work and comes to terms with us just not being compatible and moving on into different cinematic universes, I shook it off pretty quickly. However, it wasn't soon after that that I had a happenstance reconnection with my second significant relationship. Yeah, it was complicated in a way that made me feel in a way that really made my hopeful heart think that we were both in a better place and that things were ready to work out. We made plans to spend time with each other and she seemed really enthusiastic about seeing me again. We met up and had a really great time. And then after an awkward conversation with one of our mutual friends regarding the meetup, I was informed that she drum roll has a boyfriend. Now, this one definitely hurt a bit more than the first, probably because our breakup was a little more fresh and I definitely still had my share of hope for us. However, her behavior towards me culminating in her not mentioning that she's in a relationship was a bit of a turnoff, thankfully. But with both of these situations kind of happening at once, I developed some internal discomfort over the fact that both of the girls I thought I really had a connection with are both now with men. Nothing against men. And I'm fully aware that sexuality is a spectrum and bisexuality exists, of course. Both of these exes, however, never really labeled themselves when they were with me. This, along with a couple of things my friends and even my mother offered uh, regarding the scenario that these women were just quote experimenting with me or not gay enough to commit to me long term has gotten me really in my head before you say I should get some new friends and a new mother haha uh, part of me agrees and also the side of queerness is definitely not easy to understand I should mention that I am mask presenting and primarily attracted to feminine presenting women I'm all of a sudden spiraling about the legitimacy of my past loves and questioning whether something is true or real and it is out there for me. Part of me does agree with my friends and feel used to an extent, but most of me just feels discouraged and isolated. I definitely don't have a lot of queer friends at the moment either, so these feelings are hard to articulate and even harder to find a meaningful conversation about. I'm hoping you can shed some of your humble musings as some of my queer role models. I appreciate you guys for all that you do. You truly are and have been a shining light for people like me. I hope you have a wonderful day. That's so nice. That is so nice, Drezilla. Thank you for saying that and for writing to us. Um, you know, I think that this experience that you're having of of like these sort of 
X's coming out of the woodwork and making you feel things that are surprising to you uh, is really normal and understandable. And I think that like, no matter what age you are, <laughs> this kind of stuff happens where it's like, oh, I didn't realize that that person was married or like, oh, they got a new job. I'm so jealous, right? Where it's just like, what, why is the stink thing still in me? Like what, I thought I was over this. So I'm sorry that you are dealing with that. And then add on to that, this whole layer of gender and sexuality and some of these like common tropes that we have about bisexual people in our lives. Um, and the feeling that you're like, wait a minute, this was not how I was envisioning my healing going when it comes to these two people that I dated. Um, that's a really hard place to be. So I'm really thankful that you decided to reach out to us and to offer us a glimpse into what you are going through. Um, and Sierra and I are going to talk a little bit about queerness and healing and exes and all of the things. Uh, but before that, we're going to take a quick break. All right, my darlings, welcome back. And thank you to our letter writer for trusting us with this letter. Um, I think, I think there are a couple things happening here that I just want to name. Um, one thing that is happening is some sort of like queer existential crisis, <laughs> you know, about the legitimacy of, you know, you, um, your lovability, the legitimacy of your relationships. Um, what does it mean to be experimenting in through the lens of queerness um, and how, uh, how do we not take that personally? Um, and another thing that's happening here is heartbreak. You, you got your hopes up and you're disappointed and that hurts no matter what your gender or your sexuality is. Um, and I think they might be compounding each other. They're both valid. They're both real emotional reactions that make a lot of sense to Sam and I. And also I think it's important to, um, just put some space between them for a second um, while we talk about them. You know, it's okay to be hurt um, that your exes have moved on. And it's even okay because, like, we often can't control our emotional re responses. It's okay to feel particularly hurt by who your ex moves on with. And at, in the same moment, you know, sexuality is a spectrum bisexuality does exist and it is to in the, in the same moment that you can be hurt by that choice you also have to reach beyond that hurt make space for your and your ex's whole diverse humanity and recognize that who they move on with in no way delegitimizes their connection with you and if we if we believe that it does and that is like biphobia in action and and listen i am not um blaming you for this or judging you for this this is even a thought pattern that i have that my partners have had like this is kind of ingrained with us in the same way that the gender binary and the bi binary of sexuality is um i i but let me just let me let me share a personal story to to be the backdrop of this conversation. Um, I dated, had an ongoing tumultuous situationship um, with a woman, and I, because I'm a poet and I'm an artist, I wrote poems about her. Uh, um, <laughs> and then also because I'm a sucker and a poet and 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 love to harm myself, I. <laughs> I remained um, friends with her after we had like a really blow up mm. separation because mm -hmm. like, that's just what you got to do until yeah, you, why, until why you find you? a podcast <laughs> called just break up and you learn that you don't have to do that. Uh -huh. But I hadn't created the podcast yet. I hadn't heard it. Um, so um, anyway, I remember I, during the time that we were together, I wrote these love poems about her. And then after we separated, uh, oh, no, no. I think it was while we were together, I applied for like a queer writer's grant that would um, pay me a very a small amount of money to write the 
write an original poem f to be um, set to music, like for like an orchestra to sing, to play and like a choir to sing. It was very cool. Um, it was like the Minnesota gay choir or something like that. And um, so I ended up writing, um, I like took some poems that I wrote about her and made like a four piece um, poem, you know, w with some new stuff worked in there, but like there was some of these poems about her in it and I, and I got the grant and, you know, months later, it was like a long process for the composer and whatnot. They finally sent me a video of the gay choir singing, um, and the orchestra playing this, this, poem that I had written essentially. And I happened to, this was maybe like nine months after we separated or, or, you know, close to a year after we separated and we were like in the same city or something. And I think we went out to dinner and I, I showed her this video. I was like, Hey, isn't this cool? Like, remember I wrote these poems about you when we were together or whatever we were. <laughs> and, and this person's response was, um, that there were that there were more gay people out there that deserved it more than I did because they I were more gay. <laughs> um, because I dated men in addition to women. Mm, um, sure. And I think I was like, I think this is the first time that I was like so disillusioned by them because all I could think, and I think all I said to them was, I loved you. I loved you. And we spent those months together in whatever capacity. And Sam and I are going to have a conversation about experimenting and about finding yourself through dating. But I just wanted to share that as a personal example of like, no matter who your ex moves on with, it is so rarely a reflection of the relationship that you had with them. And, to, and in the terms of gender and sexuality, like through that lens, to it's okay to be hurt by it and also we have a responsibility to the humanity of the people we once loved to reach beyond that hurt and see that just because their current partner maybe doesn't look like they're look like you did or whatnot doesn't mean that their love for you and their time with you was less legitimate. Like, I think the narrative that experimenting is bad or experimenting is something that inherently that you dabble in and then like scurry back to heterosexuality. Like that narrative is, is by phobia at its finest, you know, and we all have it. We all have it. I remember at the, at the women's college I went to, we all would make jokes about the lugs, the lesbian until graduation. And in the back of my head during that time of my life, when I was like 19, I was so afraid to be like, yeah, and I have sex with men too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it just, because it wasn't real, you know, <laughs> nobody thought it was real. Everybody thought it was just pretending or like playing dress up in gayness. And I guess I, I, I so strongly empathize with this. And also being somebody who has loved many lesbians who have felt this pain. I know it. I, I, I understand it. And I feel for your pain. I, I know that there's a deep, almost cultural wound that is being like poked at um, because of the, the pattern of, of women, um, you know, dating women in secret, keeping those relationships under lock and then going off and having a public relationship that's more hetero presenting. I, I understand that there are roots to this pain. And also we can't free ourselves from the limitations of the gender and sexuality binary until we start putting in that work both ways. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's important for us to remember that like the measure of our queerness is not like how many people of what genders we've slept with, <laughs> but like instead, like what is our commitment to um, sort of like deconstructing the norms of heterosexuality, which means that you could still be in a relationship across genders and it could be like a queer relationship because both of you are queer and are examining and making choices about what your relationship looks like. Right. And like, you know, I know a lot of people who 
uh, identify or like who are men who sleep with men who are like not super queer in how they approach the world. And I know like a lot of straight couples who are really asking themselves these important questions about what relationships look like or should look like. And, and I think it's important for us to like hold that it's not just about like what genitals go on, what type of other genitals, <laughs> but like also about like what commitments are we making to to where what we want the world to look like and how we want to treat each other. Um, and I think that that's really important. And I know that like, you know, you say in your letter, Dre, that like you don't have a lot of queer people around you and that like some of this stuff like is pretty ingrained in the people like your mom or your friends. And I, and I think it's really understandable, right? Like I, I really wish that they wouldn't say stuff like that. And also I totally understand that they have learned that way of thinking about particularly about bisexual people, but I don't want that sort of way of thinking, that deeply ingrained way of thinking to make you doubt the legitimacy of your relationship with the two people that you dated, right? Like just because they went off and started dating people who are not of the same gender doesn't mean that they didn't want to be with you or doesn't mean that your relationship wasn't important or that you didn't learn things from it or that you didn't love them and, or that they didn't, you know, love or really like you back. Right. Like there's the, the reality of what happens after doesn't actually have any bearing on what happened during when it comes to relationships. And honestly, that's why I started like my, um, little, rant (laughs) by saying there's two things happening here. There's a, there's a inquisition about what, you know, what is experimenting through the queer lens and how does that like meld together and, you know, whatever. And then there's also heartbreak because like, you know what, here at Just Break Up, we get literally hundreds of letters from people saying my ex moved on with blank right? No matter what their identity is, no matter what genitals they have, you know, and, and the core of their letter is how could they move on with that person? That makes me feel like what we did had wasn't real, right? How could they move on so fast? How could they date this person? How could they not want to be with, you know, like it's, it's all comes down to a rejection wound, which is at the end of the day, the like the most core, wound the most painful simple thing which is not all people are for us right and that's why I wanted to say that because like this is a queer issue and also it's a heart issue you know for sure for sure yeah and I think you know we we think about some of these specific situations particularly like women who date women and then go on to to date men afterwards as like experimenting, right? Like we're like, they're using people in their lives to like understand something about themselves. And for sure that might to a certain extent be true. And I want to create space for the idea that like all of us are experimenting in dating. Like all of us Mm -hmm. are trying people on for size. And I think that the idea that we want to like learn how to be in relationship with people, learn more about ourselves, learn about what we're attracted to, not attracted to how we want to be in relationship in the relationships that we're in, right? Like that learning process I think is important for us. And, and some people get vilified for it and some people don't. And I think it's important for us to like recognize some of the ways that that happens and specifically bisexual people get vilified for it in ways that I never have been, even though I have experimented in my own relationships with people. Uh, And I think it's important to like name that, that, that experimentation, that learning about ourselves, about trying new things is a core part of understanding, not just who we want to date and how we want to date people, but also like understanding our own aspects of ourselves, our identities, our experiences. And, and that's critically important. So yes, these folks were learning something new about themselves. Maybe this was the first time that they had tried something. And that doesn't mean that their appreciation for you is any less or diminished. Right. And, and that, and their rejection of you, of course, hurts no matter what, but it yeah. doesn't need to be sort of like 
taken out of the proper context of the pain that it caused and put into someplace else yeah. where then we're, we're thinking about it and trying to examine it under a microscope well, rather than sitting in the really painful and difficult feeling of somebody I really loved who I thought maybe I was going to get back together with has moved on, right? Is with yes. someone else now. Oof. What a devastating gut punch to, to like say those words out loud. Like, Oh, yeah. that totally, totally sucks. And how do we sit in the suckiness of it and and not try and like think our way into something different off ramp what we're feeling about the situation by over intellectualizing it or, or intellectualizing it yeah. or like allowing yeah. other people to rob us of our experience of it by believing them when they say, well, maybe it wasn't a real relationship, right? Like. I want yeah. you to feel how much this sucks, not because I want you to feel sucky, but because it sucks. And so sometimes that feeling yeah. has to come up because it's just a shitty situation. It's just a painful yeah. thing to be in. Yeah. And I'm thinking about two last things. Like when Sam and I say experimenting, we're using that word intentionally because that's the word that has been bestowed upon queer folks and bisexual folks, you know, yep. anybody who who we want to deem as illegitimate you know what i mean for sure and we say experimenting because it's flippant and superficial and like oh we're the, you know just dabbling in this or like you know we're experimenting but we're going to return to the quote unquote normal right um but when we say experimenting when we say everyone experiments in dating and relationships what we mean uh, and and sam said as much as like Everyone uses their lived experiences to better meet and understand themselves. Everyone puts themselves in new situations, introduces themselves to new people, new experiences, and then processes, you know, we process that experience and we take what we want from it, right? Like, I, I feel like there is a flippancy to the word experiment. So just to make sure we're all using it in the right way in the same way. That's what we mean. And the other thing I want to say is I know there's at least like 10% of the just breakup listeners out there that are saying, yeah, but right. Yeah. But I did date that asshole who, who was just sort of like vacationing in my life, in my identity. And then they flitted away. Right. You know, and, and to that, I want to say, Yes, there are assholes. Yes, people date recklessly, right? <laughs> they do, yes. People experience other humans recklessly. And also, they are complex. They, We all have that journey. We all have the capacity to date recklessly. And if we look at it in that context, if we, if we widen the lens, it's not a queer thing. It's not a bisexual thing. It's not a straight woman in, you know, a, a lesbian until thing. Right. It's a human thing. All humans can be assholes. Turns out. <laughs> turns <laughs> you know out. Yes. I mean? Like bisexuals it, it really has nothing to do are not predisposed your... to assholery. Turns exactly. out. <laughs> yes. And you know, and, and, and like, you know, the, the narrative that bisexuals are, are like selfish or whatever. It's like, no, fucking humans are selfish, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and maybe that's just the bis bisexual, the selfish bisexual in me wanting well, to clear the air. you are unfortunately yeah. a bisexual Gemini. So uh, like worst of both worlds, unfortunately yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah. But okay. So um, I, I, I want to end this response because I do want, I want to end this response saying this to our like queer brethren. Um, I love you and I see your pain and I validate it in the same breath that I push against it. Right. I know this pain is coming from somewhere real and we have to acknowledge that wound before we can heal it, before we can tend to it. So um, I know that there is a lot of queer scarcity, you know, there is this sort of swallowed pill that like, because we are not the quote unquote norm, that there is not as much love out there for us, which I think is one of the reasons why we cling to the stigmas that heteronormati heteronormativity gives us, you know, that like, of course, this person, you know, didn't love me because they were just pretending or whatever. Um, that scarcity was given to us. We, we inherited it. It's not of us. Right. And I just want to say to you that like, you are so incredibly lovable. Your lovability is abundant. And there are people out there who 
will love you so much better than these first two significant loves will. And guess what? You have no idea who they're sleeping with right now in this moment. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, 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 and what path will lead them to you and the ability to love you so wholly and so well. Um, and, and that's truly a thing of, it's about letting go of, of control saying, I don't know who out there is going to love me, but I'm open to them. I'm open to them and, and the myriad of paths that will lead them to me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so sorry that you are finding yourself in this situation, but I love that Sierra left us with a little bit of hope, right? Cause that's, that is what keeps us going. Um, and, and, especially in this moment that we've been talking about, I think that hope is something that we can all find more of in our lives. So thank you for writing. Thank you for asking us this question. We love you. We love you so much. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like more content from us, or if you would like access to our monthly office hours, you can support us on Patreon. If you support us on Patreon for as little as $5 a month, you'll get an additional bonus weekly episode as well as access to those office hours. That's patreon.com slash justbreakuppod. You can slide into our DMs, send us your favorite relationship memes, but most importantly, you can submit your questions about all matters of the heart at justbreakuppod.com, which is also where you can find our merchandise. Please remember to like, follow, subscribe, give us a five-star rating and review. This literally keeps our mics on and helps us reach more brokenhearted souls who need two random strangers giving them relationship advice. Just Break Up is a production of Duvid Media, original music, recording, editing, producing all magical things by our good friend Spencer Worth Davis. Make sure to check out his podcast and his music. And remember, the reasons why other people choose that they cannot love us have nothing to do with our lovability, with our worthiness. It's so rarely, it so rarely is a reflection of us and is always a reflection of them and their journey and their needs, their life, their diversity of experience doesn't diminish the validity of the love you shared at one time. And if all else fails, just break up. <laughs>